This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. At our Military History Night of March 10th, Dr. Alex Sushin of Royal Military College of Canada introduced his new book, The Surprising History of War Junk, in which he examines how a country dedicated to total war production deals with the ensuing legacy of overproduction, some of it toxic and or somewhat explosive. March the 10th, 2021. My name is Patricia Hindwhite and I organize this event. This presentation will be videotaped for educational purposes and available on RCMI YouTube channel. Um, there will be a question and answer period following this presentation and um, for those who wish to um, verbally uh, ask a question, please use the raise hand function and uh, please mute your mics until that time. At this time, I would like to recognize the RCMI behind the scenes team of RCMI President Mike Hall, General Manager Garrett Wright, Event Sales Manager and in-house Zoom expert, Sylvia Lau. Eric Morse, RCMI edu 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 sorry, editor, Members News, Director of Publications, a member of the RCMI Strategic Studies Committee, and I'm producer of RCMI videos, and uh, Jim Lutz, Chairman of the Events, uh, of the events Committee. Our guest speaker this evening is Dr. Alex Sushin, and his topic, the surprising history of war junk, munitions, disposal, and post-war reconstruction in Canada. Our speaker is a historian specializing in the Second World War, Canadian society, and the, the environment. He is the author of War Junk, Munitions Disposal, and Post-War Recon Reconstruction in Canada and is currently a post-directoral fellow of the Royal Military College of Canada. He earned his PhD from the University of Western Ontario in 2016. His research interests include military history, discard studies, and environmental history. An astonishing amount of weapons and ammunition was manufactured by the Allies during the Second World War. And by 1945, American, British, and Canadian factories had produced thousands of tons of chemical weapons and roughly 55 billion rounds of ammunition and shells. While much of this was sold off to allied countries, the addition of captured German and Japanese munitions added substantially to the surplus accumulating in the Ordnance Depot. So what happened to these implements of war? How and where did their disposal take place? Tonight we will uh, we'll, um, have an illustration of that. That being said, and without further ado, a warm welcome, Alex, and virtually the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Pat, for that wonderful introduction. And, and thank you all for coming tonight uh, to a book launch for War Junk, Munitions Disposal, and post-war reconstruction in Canada. I'm very grateful to be back at the RCMI. Uh, it's just so unfortunate that we couldn't be together in person, but I think the virtual format has a lot of things to offer and, and it certainly uh, increases turnout to some extent. Uh, and I'm very happy uh, that it will hopefully stick around in the future. And so uh, tonight, uh, I'm just about to share my screen with you and uh, tonight, uh, I'd like to accomplish uh, th three objectives of sorts uh, for my talk. So first, I'm going to introduce you to the history of munitions disposal and its connections to post-war reconstruction and rehabilitation in Canada after the Second World War. And the goal here is to demonstrate the importance of military surpluses and get you to reconsider some of the value regimes uh, that define our conceptions of garbage and waste. The second objective is to explore the dark side of munitions disposal and discuss the lingering health and environmental hazards 
as well as some of the failures and problems with Canada's uh, disposal strategy. And finally, the last objective here is to write myself into the story about how this uh, book has evolved over time. And maybe I'm just a huge book nerd, uh, but I'm always fascinated by how the, the author's background and story uh, underpin uh, the, the subject lines and the book itself. And so I'd like to know at least more about the author. And that's why I thought I'd sort of write myself into this story. And so I'm going to essentially fill you in on some of my own writing journey. And to start that journey off, we need to go way back to August of 2012, when I was standing in front of this chicken statue and my entire PhD dissertation started making sense. A year removed uh, from the hell of comprehensive exams, uh, I had uh, been in the throes of archival research in Ottawa uh, since May, uh, but I still found the time to travel to England, uh, where I happened to visit uh, Leeds and tour the Royal Armouries Museum. And for the, at the time, I had never heard of the Royal Armouries before, but I can tell you it was an absolutely awesome experience. Its impressive artifact collection spans almost every conceivable type of armament from almost every decade of British history. And it even hosts a live jousting match outdoors on a specially made jousting pit. Uh, and certainly that tournament would have been the highlight of my trip had I not stumbled across this chicken statue. And this chicken statue is called Bird That Wants to Survive. And I found it tucked away in an exhibit titled Farewell to Arms the only part of the armories devoted to peace. And this chicken statue stopped me dead in my tracks. And I even let out this big gasp as I read the description. And so leave it to a military historian in a room full of guns and swords and bombs from every century of human history to be literally blown away by a chicken. So what's up with this chicken? Uh, why should we care? Well, there's two points that clarify its significance. So bear with me for a moment. The first point has to do with the early context surrounding my research. Uh, before the trip to England, I had been uh, at Ottawa at the Library and Archives Canada for about four months doing intensive amounts of research. But at the time, I was mainly researching on a hunch, which in basic terms was a question about the objects of war. Were objects, much like veterans, rehabilitated when the Second World War ended? Several hypotheses and questions and starting points had solidified my initial curiosity. For instance, I quickly realized that the objects of war don't simply disappear when the shooting stops. So it was obvious that they outlived the state of war and somehow survived in peacetime. This in turn meant that the objects also continued occupying a physical space, thereby posing a logistical dilemma for demobilizing militaries. While any changes to that object's form or function had to be imposed on them by different custodians and value regimes over time. And finally, I recognized that an object's lifespan and transition into peaceful purposes uh, might not easily fit into the war's traditional periodization. After all, an object could be rehabilitated into new uses or completely destroyed years after 1945. And so although these starting points provided some fodder uh, to test against the archival grain, back in 2012, the full scope of my inquiry and interest remained elusive and unclear. And the second point that clarifies the significance of this chicken statue has less to do with the fact that it's a chicken and more to do with what it's made out of. This chicken is made out of scrapped AK-47s that were exchanged in a Guns for Tools program organized by the Christian Council of Mozambique to help end the civil war that had been raging there in the 1980s. After collecting the weapons, the Christian Council gave them to local artists who turned them into sculptures for an exhibition in London. If you Google arms into art, Mozambique, you'll find an amazing assortment of art and sculptures that are all made from surplus weapons. So although this statue has nothing to do with my research interests on the disposal of Canada's munitions and supplies in the 1940s, it was probably the most important discovery that I made during the course of my PhD research. In light of all my archival work that summer and all the questions that I had swirling around in my head, this chicken was the first artifact that I saw that proved my research hunch correct. This was my aha moment. Objects transition between war and peace, and in doing so, they maintain profound political, 
economic, social, and environmental significance, just like the war junk from the Second World War. In, in the case of Canada's Second World War experience, the government and military reversed wartime logistics to ensure that the flood of military surpluses would support and not hinder post-war reconstruction and rehabilitation. And as I argue in my book, Canada had a disposal strategy that was shaped by public pressure, business interests, political imperatives, and the prevailing economic landscape. Its goals were to facilitate an object's conversion uh, into peacetime uses in order to support political authority, economic stability, and public safety. In the end, thrifty Canadians took full advantage by reusing and recycling surplus munitions and supplies to improve their living standards during a turbulent post-war transition that was characterized by severe material shortages. In that sense, munitions disposal was a crucially important part of demobilization, but it was also a process that had a dark side, rife with acrimony over prices and depreciating assets, while decontamination and cleanup efforts were hamstrung by shortened timelines and budgetary constraints, which inevitably caused significant environmental degradation. Now, in forming this argument, I borrowed some insights from other fields, like discard studies in the history of technology. In particular, I found David Egerton's book, The Shock of the Old, to be a very instructive and influential book, since he explored the history of technology and argued that modernity has created this cultural emphasis in our society, which ignores the usage and significance of old technologies. In the book, Egerton makes a convincing case against the linear conceptions of technological progress, in which we define progress as a series of new inventions, replacing or improving upon the old ones. So think of the iPhone 8 becoming the iPhone 9, becoming the iPhone 10. And as Egerton shows, such a paradigm is great for marketing, but it's not really representative of the actual usage of technologies. Sometimes we don't acquire that new piece of technology right away because we like the old one better or because we can't afford the more expensive and newer model. Other times, new inventions only become useful decades after being invented or when combined with other technologies uh, to create a more useful derivative or hybrid. And this persistent survival of old things and their adaptations into new forms and functions is an important theme in my book, and I'll return to it in a second. But for the time being, just think of that old iPhone you got rid of, now getting reused secondhand by someone else or broken up for spare parts. Old things survive within this dual context of thriftiness and disassembly because these actions unlock different forms of value. Following the Second World War, the Canadian government, much like every other allied nation, oversaw a disposal program that was designed to promote thriftiness and disassembly precisely because those actions used up leftover military surpluses. To thrifty consumers and entrepreneurs, weapon systems are just that, networks of objects working together to create an output, meaning that the parts and uh, components forming the sum could often be more valuable than the whole. Since wartime controls over resources and production had curtailed the availability of new civilian goods immediately following the war, you can start to see the added value of reclamation. Sometimes the only source of goods and parts was the government's inventory. Therefore, military surpluses were reused and recycled into new purposes, which is one of the most important events to occur during the transition from war to peace. I mean, just think back to that chicken statue and what it represents, guns not shooting people. Now, this topic and argument might seem a little unconventional at first, but I think there is actually a, a fairly obvious one to make. I mean, who really thinks that all the unneeded machine guns suddenly vanished when the Nazis surrendered? Hopefully no one does. But if you read any history of the war, you might actually get that impression, since most accounts end when the fighting stops. And of the few that push past that 1945 bookend, most will only deal with human topics like veterans rehabilitation. So I suppose therein lies some of my book's originality. Most people don't spend time thinking about the post-war lives of military objects or the longevity of, of product life cycles in general or how and why we discard things we no longer require. And today, the appetite for new stuff often means that our concerns and priorities are conditioned 
by acquiring new things and new technologies, even if the old ones are still useful. As Giles Slade argues in his incredible book, Made to Break, this is a consequence of living in a world dominated by planned obsolescence. It's affected how we think about our possessions, how we devalue our garbage, and it's dulled curiosity for how disposal works and affects our lifestyles. Today, we are inundated with such a diverse material opulence grounded in vast inventories of cheap and disposable products. And as a result, we tend to take the material world surrounding us for granted. But this was a luxury that few people in the 1940s could afford. Think about this for a second. Today, every American citizen is destined to generate at least 102 tons of garbage over their lifetimes. And there are some indications that Canadians are more wasteful. For instance, in 2008, we discarded an average of 777 kilograms of solid municipal waste per person that year. In 2012, the average dropped to two kilograms per person, but we still generated 33.4 million metric tons of waste and about 25 million of that total was sent to landfills and incinerated rather than recycled. We count our pennies, we count our calories, and we count our blessings, but few of us ever count our garbage. And yet that trash that we create has a life cycle that lasts long after it leaves our possession. It therefore maintains a political, an economic, social and environmental significance, just like that war junk from the 1940s. And given the omnipotence of today's wastefulness, it is really quite refreshing to research and write about how resourceful and thrifty Canadians were with the war's material legacies. And I must admit that this book has prompted me to uh, reevaluate my own wastefulness and make some attempts to curb my consumption habits. Uh, after all, I would prefer that a 102 ton monument of things Alex threw away not be my greatest and most lasting lifetime achievement. Unfortunately, it likely will be. What we throw away can tell us a great deal about ourselves as individuals, as uh, communities, and as a civilization. And similarly, I argue, how we throw things away can offer insights into past priorities and strategic considerations as people make decisions between opportunity costs. Therefore, Within the context of Canada's Second World War experience, the subject of munitions disposal uh, is more than just a military history topic. It's a topic that cuts across many disciplines and subfields because the term disposal is defined as a two-way process of relinquishment and acquisition in which one party considers an object unneeded and transfers it to another party through a transaction or trade. Trash for some was treasure for others. So munitions disposal is not just tied to military affairs, disarmament, or demobilization. Rather, it's a story about the material world underpinning the transition between total war and peace and how those suddenly unneeded objects transition between different forms, uses, and value regimes to impact post-war developments. And so let's take a closer look at those post-war developments. The story of how Canada disposed of surplus military uh, pro, pro, uh, assets uh, and wartime productivity, um, you know, it, it starts with wartime productivity rather. No one in 1939 was talking about getting rid of weapons and equipment. Not only was this counterproductive to winning the war, but the weaponry available to Canada's military was exceedingly small. And that situation changes dramatically uh, following the Allied defeats at Dunkirk, Pearl Harbor, and Singapore. And in response, the Canadian government formed the Department of Munitions and Supply, or DMS, to control and regulate and fund the production of war materials for both the nation's armed forces and those of its allies. From 1940 until 1945, the DMS spent billions of public money procuring mountains of munitions and supplies, ranging from bed frames to boots and typewriters to tanks. And I posted some statistics here on the slide to give you a sense of the scale. And looking at those numbers more closely, I find it hard to fathom Canada as a peaceable kingdom anymore. I mean, we produced over 144,000 tons of TNT in under six years. If we put all of that TNT in one spot and blew it up, the total blast yield would be equal to about eight Hiroshima-sized atomic detonations. Now, this surge in all-out production was not unique to Canada. 
It was replicated in other countries because the Allied armies required a seemingly infinite assortment of weapons and equipment to defeat Germany and Japan. However, while this output was a wartime necessity, Allied victory in 1945 caused major industrial uh, and logistical dislocations. The war's end triggered a global disposal crisis. Without an enemy to fight, all this procurement was well in excess of post-war requirements. So what happened to all this leftover stuff? And how did the government divest its surplus assets? And these questions were incredibly important because in winning the war, the Allies had overproduced, which meant that the post-war economy was under serious threat. Many people, especially business executives and public officials, were terrified about the deflationary economic conditions that would arise if an uncontrolled flood of government-owned surpluses entered the marketplace. This was threatening, not only because the costs of production had already been paid out during the war, but, the, uh, but also because it would force the post-war economy into competing against the vestiges of wartime production. Therefore, a flood of cheaper, secondhand goods would undercut the demand for future products and over the long term, lower prices for new goods, employment, and profits. Fears of deflation were widespread and transnational, and they owed their origins to demobilization after the First World War. Looking back on the experiences in 1919 and 1920, when sales of government surpluses were largely unregulated and speculators had profited, officials in Canada, Britain, and the US saw only failures and mistakes. And in those countries, there was particular hatred for the speculator or someone who buys large stocks of goods on the assumption that they'd make profits on resale, but who has no stake in the industries concerned. In the 1940s, speculators were blamed for the deflation that had preceded the Great Depression, and it became a rallying cry of sorts for policymakers planning disposal during the war. And I think the quote up there on the slide by John Barry really demonstrates the point. Barry was the president of the War Assets Corporation, or WAC, which was the crown company set up to address the disposal problem in Canada, and it's the institution that my book examines in detail. The false boom and subsequent evil that he is referring to are most definitely the Roaring Twenties and the Dirty Thirties. Now, not everyone was so fearful of deflation and economic turmoil. And in fact, many social interest groups and municipal and provincial governments saw the impending liquidation of federal property as a valuable opportunity. Like businesses, they favored increasing government regulations to control the flood of goods. But instead of destroying everything, like some business associations demanded, they wanted surpluses redeployed to improve living conditions, ease housing shortages, and improve other social welfare programs. Therefore, the disposal of munitions and supplies became entwined within the larger debates about post-war social security. If the state was going to fulfill its expanding obligations for the social welfare of its citizens and veterans, then it needed to maintain big government services by keeping all its assets and property. And in that sense, Canada's disposal strategy steered a fine line between supporting economic recovery for private enterprise and the state's expanding social welfare responsibilities. So if you haven't noticed yet, the disposal problem was a pretty complex issue. And that's why the WAC was established in November of 1943. The WAC was responsible for planning and implementing a disposal strategy, in addition to handling all the physical aspects of disposal, including collection, appraisals, storage, maintenance, sales, and destruction. Despite some public criticism and controversy, the WAC's operations became a crucial pillar for the post-war transition because it successfully reversed wartime logistics and also encouraged Canadians to reuse and recycle leftover munitions and supplies. And although this concept of reverse logistics was coined later in the 20th century, I think officials in the WAC would have understood its meaning. Reverse logistics is defined as the process of moving goods back from the point of consumption to the point of origin for the purposes of recapturing value or initiating proper disposal. And if the concept of uh, reverse logistics is still a little unclear, the best example I can give you is the act of returning your empty alcohol bottles to the beer store here in Ontario. So how did the WAC reverse wartime logistics without de deflating the post-war economy? 
Well, in short, the WAC positioned itself as a wholesale distributor and adopted restrictive selling practices that prohibited direct sales to the public. Only verified businesses, public institutions, and social welfare groups could make purchases from the WAC, thereby cutting out speculators. Basically, Barry designed the WAC's operations to buttress legitimate trade networks by recirculating goods back through the industries that had just produced them. Now, this policy caused significant acrimony and confusion amongst average Canadians who expected to make direct purchases from the WAC at discounted prices. But the type of open access retail network that people expected was precisely what Barry was trying to avoid because that would promote speculation and price deflation. And the complaints about access and prices appearing in the media sullied the WAC's reputation as people were unhappy about having to buy surplus goods through regular channels and often at very marked up prices. But the WAC system of reverse logistics was uh, designed to achieve larger structural objectives within the economy that were not always evident when Canadians opened their wallets to pay more for things during a period of severe material shortages and a turbulent post-war transition. The main goal was always about economic stability. So the WAC's reverse logistics proved to be very profitable for pre-existing or established businesses because it supported the status quo. For example, established shipping companies had first dibs on leftover cargo vessels and used those purchases to expand their operations, while many of those boats remained in operations until the 1960s. The automotive industry profited handsomely as well when companies bought back vehicles, equipment, and raw materials. Not only did these types of purchases fuel future production, but they also limited the supply of spare parts to licensed dealers, which perhaps forced people to buy new cars instead of using the black market to fix up the old one. So in that larger structural sense, the government's disposal strategy was enabling the levers of repetitive consumption while also buffering gaps in production, stocking shelves, maintaining brand loyalty, and using established trade networks to recondition military pattern kit according to civilian markets, laws, and civilian safety standards. Furthermore, social welfare organizations, public institutions, and local governments received special provisions for acquiring goods. Before anything was sold to businesses, these institutions were invited to submit priority requests, and if the goods were available, the WAC sold them directly. In doing so, the WAC was able to redistribute items that were urgently needed for the post-war transition. Hospitals and relief organizations profited immensely, but universities and vocational training schools probably benefited the most. These institutions were under extreme pressure to both house and teach thousands of new student veterans uh, attending classes through their rehabilitation benefits. As a result, they purchased long lists of items and property, like those huts at UBC there up in the top right of the slide. Additionally, provisions were also put in place so the state could strategically divest assets according to its self-interests. Consequently, leftover kit was sold either as military aid to other allies, like the Dutch, who then reused the weapons to fight colonial revolutionaries in Indonesia, or as aid to police forces, which hints at a long and concerning history of police militarization. Now, reusing military surpluses to fulfill their primary and intended functions was always the most desired and valuable outcome, but we have to remember that there were many other types of munitions and supplies that could not make that tactical to practical transition. And in fact, there were many things that retained value only if they were disassembled or significantly renovated. The best example of this process that I can show you here involves surplus aircraft. Since there were severe material shortages in post-war Canada, many people had to make do and get creative with second choices. And the fact that aircraft were composed of thousands of different parts and technologies made them extremely versatile. In one case, an Air Force uh, veteran near Hamilton, Ontario, bought seven Ventura bombers and turned them into tourist cabins 
by cutting off the wings and renovating the insides. I'm not sure how long he stayed in business, but he ingeniously bypassed the shortages in building materials by upcycling old airframes to expand his gas station business. And this thriftiness was not an isolated case. And in fact, the term barnyard bomber became synonymous with surplus aircraft in Western Canada because farmers eagerly bought them to cannibalize for spare parts around the farm, like these Lancaster bombers seen here in Alberta. So understanding how the war's materiality was discarded and transformed really helps illuminate the profound legacies of militarization and demobilization within Canadian society. And if I've piqued your curiosity, uh, my book discusses these subjects in far more detail than I can offer here. Now, up to this point, uh, the story uh, of munitions disposal has been generally positive and productive. Uh, but the history of munitions disposal has its dark side. And in fact, there are some really ominous and disconcerting legacies for the environment and public health more generally, which I have been researching more closely since I finished my PhD in 2016. And in particular, uh, I've been focusing on the steep environmental costs of ordnance destruction in relationship to ocean pollution. When the Second World War ended, one of the most concerning commodity chains related to ammunition, explosives, and chemical weapons. Ammunition production had been colossal during the war, and even though large portions were expended in battle or needed for post-war military purposes, there were still substantial leftovers. I mean, the U.S. produced something like 41 billion rounds of ammunition, the British over 11 billion, and Canada produced 4.4 billion rounds of ammunition, in, and in addition to that, 200 million artillery shells and cartridges. These types of assets posed very serious challenges to post-war political authority, public safety, and they also represented a continuing financial and storage burden for demobilizing militaries. Additionally, the mountains of captured enemy ordnance threatened occupational security, while the war's destruction in Europe and Asia further complicated trans uh, transportation and logistical situations. And at the time, there were generally only four destruction methods that were available, incineration, controlled detonations, scrapping, and ocean dumping. For a variety of reasons and limitations, none of these methods could handle the entire volume of leftovers alone. So they were all used when feasible and sometimes in conjunction with one another. Open air burning or incineration was used frequently, especially to destroy enemy weapon systems like those Japanese combat aircraft in the bottom left. But as you can imagine, burning explosives or chemical weapons created toxic smoke, which endangered technicians and prompted public complaints about air and soil pollution. Sometimes it even forced military authorities to evacuate uh, entire cities and towns in Germany. So you can see that incineration has some challenges, even if it is the cheapest and most straightforward destruction method available. And unfortunately, as this uh, picture on the bottom right shows, it's still used today, especially in the United States. Controlled detonations also occurred frequently. Perhaps the most famous instance was the British Bang at Heligoland Island in the North Sea. In April 1947, the Royal Navy placed 6,800 tons of explosives inside the German fortifications on the island, and the resulting explosion was the largest non-nuclear detonation in history up to that point in time. Aside from obliterating the landscape, logistics was a critical limiting factor here. You needed a large transportation network to move the ordnance and a safe place to store it beforehand. And of course, you also needed empty space so that the blast yield wouldn't level any nearby communities. And just look at that video up there and uh, from Heligoland Island and realize that it isn't an atomic weapon going off. It's just a measly 6,800 tons of high explosives going off in one shot in one remote corner of the world. However, there were millions upon millions of surplus munitions left over after the war. And in fact, the British Army alone counted 1.2 million tons of explosives surplus just in the United Kingdom. Scrapping was by far the most desired method uh, for destruction uh, because it salvaged metals and other materials that could be resold or reused. 
Uh, you know, all allied countries breaking down shells for their metal components was viewed as a important and if not worthwhile uh, public policy. However, the key limiting factors here were always capacity, cost, and the safety of technicians. And in Canada, many of the explosives factories were shutting down in 1945 and 1946. So there were fewer places that had the capacity to boil explosive compounds out of shells and then melt down the casings safely and profitably. Moreover, there were also serious incumbent health risks to scrapping uh, shells as well, not only for uh, the technicians performing the work, but also for the environment since the unprofitable and dangerous remainders still had to be disposed of nearby. And so that leaves us with one other method, dumping. Now at the time, the oceans were seen as a miracle solution for the logistics of demobilization. The Allies had the available ships, the ocean floor was remote and isolated, the water acted as a security perimeter, bulk quantities could be disposed of quickly, and as long as the weather cooperated, dumping could continue without interruption and far away from prying eyes. In fact, to contemporaries, dumping even appeared to lessen the environmental impact because water can dilute toxic substances and materials. And as other scholars have shown, for much of recorded history, the dumping of garbage, sewage, and industrial effluent was commonplace. This attitude was based on the scientific facts about dilution and the idea of threshold values meaning that there was a permissible amount of pollution that could be injected into water without affecting human health and marine environments. Now, dilution is a fact. It can mitigate the contamination of some types of pollution, but there was also significant debate over the accuracy of thresholds and dilution capacities, while policymakers tended to favor the largest numbers because that allowed them to dump more stuff. In other words, necessity reigns supreme. Allied governments had big disposal problems, so they made policies that took advantage of the gray areas and uncertainty in scientific investigations on the environmental impact. Officials believed that if they regulated the quantities and the methods used, the total amount sunk over time didn't matter because the water would dissolve or disperse the pollutants in between each dosage. And as a result, dumping became a standard pr practice that continued until the 1970s when the London Convention prohibited the practice. But by then, millions of tons of conventional and chemical munitions were jettisoned into almost every ba major body of water. From the Baltic Sea to the Great Barrier Reef, underwater munitions, as they're called now, are still there corroding away and releasing their toxic contents into marine environments. Scientists remain divided, or at the very least unsure, about the long-term microscopic dangers of chronic exposure and the slow violence associated with bioaccumulation in food webs. However, underwater munitions and their constituents, like white phosphorus, represent a significant energetic threat to fishermen, beachgoers, construction workers, and harbor employees, while the wider economic impact can be substantial. Dump sites block the construction of oil pipelines, wind farms, bridges, and transportation infrastructures, and they also force fishermen to destroy harvests when they're caught in nets, and they shut down ports, beaches, and other tourist sites when discovered nearby. And as I've recently discovered, they are also in cottage country in Lake Huron in Northern Ontario. And this is evidenced by the photo here of Canadian soldiers dumping bombs off the coast of Dyer Bay near the Bruce Peninsula in, in Georgian Bay. And the, the dumping happened in 19, uh, November of 1945. And while I think the, the black and white photo is quite substantial, especially given the guy who has a cigarette in his mouth, um, I've colorized the photos and I think it's even more substantial to see because you can clearly see the Bruce Peninsula there in the background and all of the shells, uh, which are 4.5 inch uh, howitzer shells there, as well as some that have uh, fuses in them, the black dots on some of the shells. Uh, those are uh, smoke uh, generating uh, shells, which is uh, a different type of contamination than the TNT that's in uh, all of those shells at the bottom of Dyer Bay, still corroding to this day. To conclude, uh, the war junk of past conflicts has a long and dynamic afterlife. Uh, when hostilities end, the objects accumulated to fight are often the only things available for relief, reconstruction, and rehabilitation. So the suddenly unneeded weapons of war traverse a disposal process that reshapes values, forms, functions, and meanings according to the needs of peace. What governments and militaries considered as trash could be incredibly valuable to thrifty civilians caught in a turbulent post-war transition characterized by severe material shortages. 
in the history of war junk is therefore surprising because its materiality has a long and dynamic afterlife. And I hope that you'll all consider buying my book uh, and to learn more about this long and dynamic afterlife and uh, learn more about munitions disposal and its connections to post-war reconstruction in Canada. And I posted two links, one to Amazon and one uh, directly to UBC Press's website where you can uh, buy it. And if you uh, are on Twitter, please consider following me uh, at Alex Sushin. And thank you very much for listening and I look forward to all your questions. Um, if anybody's got any questions for Alex, uh, now is your time. Oh, I see there's questions in the chat. No. Um, I did see a documentary myself on uh, war junk, and it was in Belgium, where they were still finding um, unexploded munitions. And... Uh, you know, piling them all up and destroying them at uh, various locations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a really big uh, issue uh, where, of course, the First World War was located. So um, it's a really big, dangerous thing uh, going on. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a problem that they have to deal with. Every time they do construction, they got to do a, a UXO surveys, which is uh, UXO is a, the acronym for unexploded ordnance. Yeah. Uh, so they have to do all that. And, and I mean, I don't know if you're following Twitter or anything, but uh, just recently uh, near the University of Exeter, they had to destroy a thousand kilogram German bomb. And it uh, just it was a huge explosion. Uh, you can definitely see uh, uh, some of the videos there online. Yeah, well, I believe there's some questions there. Um, oh. um, I saw something pop up there from Fraser. One from Fraser, one from Mr. Clary, I think. Um, I don't know. Uh, hmm. um, Sylvia, could you, um, are you there? Could maybe yeah, uh, sorry. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, okay, there, I see it. I, I'm just scrolling through the, the chat. All right. Um, so has... Uh, so uh, uh, Derwin has asked, uh, has anyone ever been sued for incidents involving discarded munitions and uh, war junk? I can't uh, recall any incidents uh, involving, uh, um, you know, historically uh, involving, uh, um, you know, like lawsuits. It, it's only actually in the last handful of years. So we're not looking at uh, uh, sort of like a historical set of, of lawsuits and cases uh, that are are sort of like building up over time, but it's actually only started recently, uh, I believe, it, as a result of lawsuits against in Canada, at least uh, in I believe it was the late 2000s, uh, uh, in that decade, uh, when a land developer out in Vernon bought a whole bunch of uh, land that they didn't know was actually a gunnery range. And so they went to dig all, all their houses and foundations to build a new community. And then they found out that it's littered with unexploded ordnance and it's a massively uh, a huge problem and cleanup. Uh, unfortunately, there, there is a really uh, sad and, and very concerning history of uh, the Canadian military moving into indigenous uh, communities and essentially expropriating land um, or in other cases, using the War Measures Act to literally take land. Uh, and then turning them into training uh, uh, facilities, right? And so during the war, Canada becomes this massive training facility from the British Commonwealth Air Training Program right through to uh, uh, training 1.1 million soldiers and, and, and uh, enlisted personnel to, to fight. Well, they need to shoot, they need to practice, they need to drop bombs, they, they need to do these things, they need ranges to do these things. And as a result, these places have become incredibly contaminated with uh, uh, unexploded ordnance and uh, indigenous uh, uh, groups and communities have been suing the federal government for cleanup at these sites uh, pretty consistently, though, again, it's more of a recent phenomenon as, as some of these issues are starting to come to light. And as a matter of fact, the federal government only started to, to put money aside to clean up these sites starting in 2007. So it's, it's a pretty big issue. Mm -hmm. Um, 
so David has asked, is there a dollar figure attached to how much uh, Canadian material was in fact recycled? Uh, that is a very difficult question to answer um, because they did not uh, try at least within the War Assets Corporation to maintain records about original value uh, because original values were basically procured under wartime constraints, which meant that there was like a, an inflated nature to them. There was a, a, a sort of, um, uh, they were more expensive than they would have been during peacetime sort of mentality to it. Uh, so the original price was kept by the federal departments that are declaring surplus assets. But then once they get into the war assets corporation's custody, they start um, uh, essentially uh, defining value differently, right? According to different markets and different needs. So it's actually pretty difficult to, to answer that question. Uh, but in the end, the War Assets Corporation does succeed in recouping about $500 million worth of uh, goods, which they consider to be a good thing, uh, uh, right? Considering that they're getting rid of just like piles of junk for a couple of bucks here and selling old typewriters there and, and right. And then, of course, selling like major ships and other things like that, which are bringing in a lot more money. Um, so they, they consider that to be a very good uh, amount of uh, material to be recouped. And, um, you know, uh, looking at other government disposal agencies in the United States and Britain and other things. Actually, Canada operated a pretty good disposal organization for dealing and, and, and getting rid of the assets. And I, I guess that's a really uh, big problem for the material uh, uh, culture enthusiasts and the, all these artifact collectors who uh, complain that, uh, that they can't find any spare parts or they're, the planes that they love are, are were destroyed after the war. But uh, in the context of the time, the more wasteful option would have been to just left these fleets of planes out in the middle of nowhere and not use any of the components in them. That would have been the more wasteful option. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have a specific dollar figure on recycling, uh, it, but they did do a, a relatively good job. Um, Michael has asked, what efforts are there now to do cleanup of these old dump sites? Well, in Canada, zero. Uh, the Canadian government uh, is notoriously bad for dealing with this kind of thing. Uh, and, my freedom of information request took two years to uh, um, uh, complete, and it, it had uh, reports that were highly redacted. Uh, they wouldn't even allow me to know what substances were located in these dump sites, even though I had records from other places that I didn't get through a uh, freedom of information request that had that information. Um, so uh, anyways, there's a lot of problems in that regard. So the, the, the government isn't really doing much to clean them up. They're monitoring it. Uh, but the monitoring reports are, aren't necessarily done by experts. Uh, they're on a, a government contractors or they'll do a monitoring report well, they'll, where they'll do a historical investigation. Uh, but that historical in investigation isn't dovetailed with an actual on-site investigation or they'll do it the other way around. So it's not really like a comprehensive uh, uh, process where you have like third party investigations based in universities with academics. Um, that these are government contractors uh, uh, that are brought in. Um, some of them have experience in this regard, but others have some questionable uh, uh, backgrounds. Uh, in, in other countries around the world, there's actually a really big effort to understand what, what's going on in the Baltic in particular. There's a huge multi-million euro um, uh, research programs that are going on there, largely funded by NATO. Uh, to understand what, what these uh, chemical weapons mean for fish and human health and management strategies, because uh, the Baltic Sea is relatively shallow and, and fishermen there are likely to be gassed uh, at some point in time in their careers. Um, so there's, there's a lot more uh, um, uh, you know, effort in that regard to, to clean up and understand these sites uh, at, uh, um, uh, in, in Europe but not so much in North America. And, and I, I think things got worse under the, the Trump administration in the United States. Um, Phil has asked, um, it's, it seems that there are very few uh, World War II aircraft that exist anymore. What happened to all of them? It seems odd that they have all disappeared. Actually, I, I think I kind of just answered that uh, question. They were scrapped for spare parts. It, it was either um, we keep the aircraft in a field useless or we use the metal in them for uh, building steel beams or making new metals or uh, 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 making new houses or other things like that, uh, that uh, would have put that substance to better use. 
than uh, just keeping them there for what? For what purpose? Uh, so keeping them in a field for future artifact collectors uh, to find and use uh, was not, uh, shall we say, the most uh, effective public policy for resource management. And so uh, at the end of the day, these assets are, are scrapped. Um, Alex is resolutely ignoring the raised hands. Yes, sorry, I, I don't know where they are. Break in. Okay. Sorry, I, I don't know where they are. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, uh, ask uh, away. I, I'm, I'm here. Just, uh, just one moment. Um, I believe is the raised hands uh, questions. If I you'd like oh, to... I see Fraser has, a, has his hand raised. Yeah. Where are you, Fraser? Right there. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Fraser. Okay, hi. I was involved in the summer of 1945 in a destroyer taking depth charges out to spoil ground off Halifax. I just, we just threw them over the side. We took the primer out so there was no danger of them going off and we just dumped them over the side. Now they're just lead weight with amethol inside. Is anything being done now to recover them or are they just, are they just still there? In other words, is there any kind of a, an effort? It seems to me that they're not dangerous, except that they'll gradually deteriorate. You'll end up with a lot of whatever amatol does when it gets dissolved in the water. Yeah. So amatol is a mixture of ammonium nitrate and trinitrile toluene. Yeah. Trinitrile toluene is a carcinogen, uh, or at least a suspected carcinogen. Uh, it also, however, it is a relatively stable type of explosion. It's not going to go off unless something makes it go off. No, that's right. Um, but uh, the ammonium nitrate can create anoxic zones. Uh, it's basically uh, fertilizer. Uh, so it, it is problematic to have these uh, items there. And, and they can also cause a lot of issues if they're hauled into nets that scrape the, the floor. And as far as I know that nothing is being done to clean up them, I suspect you're, you're referring to the Emerald Basin, which was one of the major uh, uh, spoiling grounds off, off uh, Halifax, where a lot of munitions were dumped, especially after the Halifax explosion in 1945 that uh, yeah. eliminated the Bedford magazine. Um, I was there as well. Yeah, so that they had to dump all sorts of stuff as quickly as possible. W what ship were you on? I don't remember. I was. I was. Uh, I had been in an Algerine, and then in that in the summer from about oh July or August to about the beginning of October, I was transferred from various ships as they were laid up, taken up to Bedford Basin, and held for either sale or scrap or whatever. And I don't remember which one it was. I just remember going out for twice on a couple of days and just throwing these depth charges over the side. And having traveled in a, an Algerine where if you used your depth charges, you were using them for a purpose to try and sink a U-boat, only we never found any. But uh, now we were just dumping them over the side and making sure that we taken the pistol out. But yeah. that was all. And I often wondered if they're just sitting there they're not they going to go off, but I, it seems to me that's not a very good idea. <laughs> yeah, it, it is not a good idea. Fortunately, uh, it, it, the Ocean Dumping Control Act in 1975 outlawed the practice, so it's not done anymore unless it's under very specific circumstances that usually involve an immediate and clear danger to the public where it has to get out and they have to deal with it. And I mean, in those types of situations, I, I can understand why ocean dumping might be still a legitimate course of action. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it was a regular thing. Every year, uh, the Canadian Navy would go out. Uh, by the fall of 1945, the, the Canadian military is dumping about 500 tons a week uh, oh, off the coast of Nova Scotia. And then that. eventually it turns into chemical weapons, uh, that they start dumping chemical weapons like uh, um, uh, magnesium powder. Uh, as well as uh, a mustard gas. Uh, there's a, even some question about lewisite. And by the 60s, they're actually dumping radioactive waste as well. Yeah. So it's, it's a very concerning history. It's something I've been working on quite passionately for the last little while. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for your question. Is there yes. um, somebody else with hands up? Eric, did you have your hands up? Alex, um, I don't know if you're aware of it. This is not a question so much as a throw in. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but there's an archeological vector to war junk. Um, it's only been about 10 or 15 years since we've discovered actual 
Roman imperial battle sites. Uh, and we find two characteristics of them. Uh, one is that the site has been scrupulously policed of metal, no matter who won, because it was just too valuable to leave in place. Mm -hmm. And two is the stuff that hasn't been, been policed is mostly tracks of hobnails from which you can actually plot where a, line, a column deployed in a line. Mm -hmm. uh, but the big one uh, was discovered about 50 years ago in, in um, Scotland, north of the um, Forth. Um, and it's 10 tons of nails. Uh, around 85 BC or AD, uh, Agricola established a legionary fortress up there. The commander found an iron ore vein. They made 10 tons of nails. And then the order came to redeploy south. And the 10 tons of nails are still there, thereby depriving everybody in Scotland of their strategic nail reserve. OK, <laughs> that's pretty interesting. Yeah, that, well, I mean, I guess uh, human societies have been using uh, the uh, waterways to dispose of all sorts of things uh, for a very, very long time. And so that kind of builds into, um, you know, the reason why they would start dumping munitions uh, or at least pioneer that practice after the First World War is because it had always been done, right? And putting something that they knew was dangerous, that they knew was uh, potentially a polluter in a place that was already contaminated um, didn't seem like much of a stretch for them. That's, that's why some of the first dumping grounds that the British choose in 1918 and 1919 are actually um, uh, the historic dumping grounds for London sewage uh, in uh, the Thames estuary. So I think that's a really interesting point that there's a really long uh, and, and concerning history involving uh, water pollution that we should pay a lot more attention to. Um, I, I see that uh, Vivian has asked a question about Beaufort's Dyke, uh, which is uh, it's, it's a really uh, interesting uh, subject because there's so much material that's been written about it, uh, mainly because in the 1990s, a British gas uh, subsidiary built a, a pipeline across Beaufort's Dyke, which separates uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland just in the northern part of the Irish Sea. And that's a place where the uh, British had dumped about 250,000 tons by the end of 1946. And between that time period and the time in which uh, dumping was outlawed in about the mid 70s, uh, they added another million more tons in this area. And so now you can just imagine um, what putting all of these uh, munitions in this location and then building a pipeline across it is a pretty concerning thing, especially because the uh, British uh, Geological Survey has noted uh, spontaneous explosions in the area. They suspect it's shells filled with lidite uh, that destabilize over time, become more volatile, and they act as a primer for uh, the, the more stable explosives like TNT and Amatol to go off. Uh, so it's actually a very concerning situation. It's been in the news uh, the last two years, exactly on uh, Valentine's Day, uh, February 14, 2020 and February 14, 2021, there was a massive uptick in the amount of uh, people that were perusing my website and some of my blog posts because uh, Beaufort's Dyke was in the news again about building a bridge across of it um, uh, to connect uh, uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland, but that's just not feasible. Now, the question that, that uh, um, was asked is about uh, nuclear waste. I'm not exactly sure. I do know that studies have found that there is radioactive isotopes in the area. But most of the radioactive waste that, that I'm aware of, uh, the British actually dumped in Herd Deep, which is uh, an area in the English Channel uh, near the, um, uh, it's uh, off the coasts or a little bit out from France and the Channel Islands. There's a very deep trench there. Uh, that's where a lot of the um, uh, 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 nuclear waste was dumped. Uh, I think there's about 16,000 tons or some, something crazy uh, that was dumped in that particular area. Uh, but that being said, there is some really serious uh, questions about radioactivity in uh, Beaufort's Dyke. Though uh, I would venture a guess that uh, the white phosphorus that's located there is the bigger threat 
because white phosphorus looks like emeralds when it washes on the shore. And emeralds are like a cool thing that you might find at the beach, pick it up. And when it's dry, it uh, burns at like 900 degrees Celsius. And it's actually injured a lot of children uh, in the area, unfortunately. Um, so uh, I think that's a really big uh, uh, question that, that I would be really like to, would really like to talk more about if I could, but uh, maybe that's a whole other uh, presentation. And um, another question here that I see in the chat is about the uh, Tucson, Arizona boneyard. Um, no, there is none that exists uh, on the same scale in Canada, at least that I know of. Uh, but there were uh, uh, dozens, uh, dozens upon dozens that existed in uh, Canada after uh, the Second World War, but they were always sort of temporary in nature. And once the material was sold, the, the boneyard was closed uh, and whatnot. And I'm now seeing uh, two questions in the, um, yes, uh, so Zenon has asked if people have tested uh, for water contamination levels and ocean dumping sites. Yes, there are a tremendous number of scientists around the world, a lot of smart people, some of whom I've been able to like interact with and learn from. Uh, they are out there, they're testing, they're taking sediment samples, they're looking at all of the derivative products to, you know, they're able to create all these models based upon these like microscopic samples that they find. They are definitely looking into this subject. So there's a lot of smart people that are uh, dealing with this particular issue. So yes, there are people uh, that are involved in this, but unfortunately, like funding's tight. There, there isn't a lot of mo community mobilization on this issue. There is actually a, a GoFundMe page that an organization I'm involved with um, uh, has just started is with the International Dialogue on Underwater Munitions. So if you, you go uh, to that website and type in underwater munitions, you'll be able to find uh, uh, that. We're, we're starting to try and gather some resources around to, to uh, hopefully establish uh, third party verification networks as much as possible uh, um, in North America for sure, uh, but uh, to help continue uh, uh, partnerships uh, across the world. And then another question uh, is coming out. Uh, do you have any information about war material from past conflicts in colonial times? Uh, oh, that is interesting. I would never have thought of that. Um, no, I, I actually, I, I can't say that I do have uh, much uh, information from, uh, let's say, uh, dumping or uh, um, uh, military war junk uh, from before the First World War. Uh, that's sort of a, a little bit beyond my uh, research gaze, but, but that would be certainly something worth uh, studying and looking into uh, in the future. Are, are there any other questions? Uh, ask the question there, uh, Alex, about the uh, atomic bomb. Um, Fraser, go ahead. Yeah. Or just uh, the question was uh, did that uh, atomic bomb that they uh, accidentally dropped in the ocean off Spain trigger, uh, and they really worked very hard to recover that because it was an atomic bomb, but did that do? pay any more attention and have any effect on recovering other war junk, if you want to call losing an atomic bomb junk? <laughs> uh, not that I, I know of. I know there's been a few uh, broken arrows uh, around um, uh, uh, around uh, our, um, you know, there's been a few broken arrows in, in the Pacific and other places, but none of them have really... Um, uh, I think mobilized uh, uh, issues on this subject. They're mainly uh, sort of considered one-off. Uh, generally speaking, the military only comes in and deals with the issue if it's a, a, a public relations uh, a thing, okay. uh, if there's an immediate danger to civilians, if they're requested to. Uh, usually they, the, the management strategy is just to leave it in place and, and it's out of sight, out of mind. No one notices it when you look out at the nice beach uh, when you're out there on the Bruce Peninsula, for instance, or whatnot, uh, that you don't know there's like a thousand tons of ordnance under the water. You don't really think that. Uh, but unfortunately, um, the, the governments have been able to profit from uh, uh, the sort of inaction and the difficulty in mobilizing on that issue. Yeah. People aren't interested. They're not interested. Exactly. Any more questions? Yes? No? 
I guess that's it then. Yeah. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Alex, for uh, drawing attention to um, a very informative and thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, I usually present you at this time with a token of appreciation from RCMI, but uh, due to the present circumstances, not possible. Yes. So um, I've got to turn the job over to Canada Post, so yeah. uh, keep an eye out. Yes, I will. I'll let you know when I get it too. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity well, here. You, which um, opened my eyes. But um, anyway, uh, I've got one announcement. Uh, next Military History Night is scheduled for April the 21st. And the topic, Canadian Military Decorations and Recognition. The speaker is Carl Gautier, and I invite you all to attend. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for your participation. And I hope to see you all again. Thank you very, very much. And thanks again, Alex, for a really interesting presentation. Thank you. Good night, all. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.